I thought we'd be pairing iconic Canadian books with various wines. Let's start with J.L. Richardson's debut, Gutter Child. I love this book, Sam. I think of this book as haunting, like it stays with you long after you've finished it. And that is actually how I think about great wines. You just keep remembering them. I would pair J.L. Richardson's book with a local favorite from Niagara, 30 Bench, Small Lot, Cabernet Franc. It's bold and it's brooding, but most importantly, this wine has great structure. Important for books too, as I understand. It's got a long finish that lasts forever. So I think it'd be a great pairing with Gutter Child. Oh my God, what a great line. So great structure and a finish that lasts forever. I feel like you're reviewing the book there. It's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, books and bottles, right? <laughs> Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 154. What do great books and great wines have in common? Why does it feel like the wine changes when you taste the same vintage years later, apart from the wine maturing, or possibly you as well? Can you pair books and bottles? And how can you organize an informal wine tasting with friends or your book club? You'll get those answers and more wine tips in my chat with Sam Hyatt, the president and CEO of The Rights Factory, a Toronto-based literary agency that represents authors in the categories of memoir, literary and commercial fiction, narrative nonfiction, and graphic novels. And I'm proud to say Sam is my literary agent. Sam and his team have also launched a brilliant new podcast about books and writing called Agent Provocateur. Each episode has thought-provoking panel debates and interviews about topics such as the merits and drawbacks of book talk or TikTok as a marketing platform, whether novelists should chase the trend by inserting COVID-related content into their manuscripts, the future of celebrity book clubs, think Reese Witherspoon, Oprah, etc., and an analysis of former U.S. President Barack Obama's most recent reading list. Sam interviews me on his podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to my podcast. In the show notes, you'll find links to Sam's podcast and his literary agency, The Rights Factory, a full transcript of our conversation, links to where you can buy my books, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 154. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show, one of my most recent book and bottle pairings was Glennon Doyle's memoir, Untamed, with an Arizariz wild ferment Pinot Noir from Chile. It's a juicy, smooth, medium body wine bursting with fleshy ripe notes of cherries. Wild ferment means the winemaker used wild airborne yeasts that float around naturally in the vineyard to ferment the wine, rather than using a commercially cultivated strain. They're looking for more dramatic flavors when they do this, as well as those that come from the vineyard itself, so the wine is a more complete expression of the land. So yes, that's the connection between a wild ferment and Glennon's untamed. Now, my favorite line in her book is, you're a goddamn cheetah. You'll have to read the book to find out what she's referring to. Okay, on with the show. For those of you who can resist everything except temptation, there's nothing better than mixing thinking and drinking. Our next piece pairs bottles and books. Today, 
Today we're chatting with Natalie McLean, who is the author of two best-selling books and the host of Unreserved Wine Talk, which the New York Times named one of the seven best drinks podcast. Hi, Natalie. Welcome to Agent Provocateur, or as they say in English, Agent Provocateur. <laughs> I love it, Sam. It's great to be here. Awesome. I'm so excited to have you. Today, I thought we'd be pairing iconic Canadian books with various wines. Let's start with J.L. Richardson's debut, Gutter Child. This is a fierce coming-of-age story set in a dystopian world, which is divided between the privileged mainland people and the disadvantaged gutter inhabitants. The heroine is one of only 100 babies taken from the gutter to be raised in the mainland as a social experiment. But when her mainland mother dies, she finds herself fighting to survive. Hmm. Wow. Good choice. I love this book, Sam. I think of this book as haunting, like it stays with you long after you've finished it. And that is actually how I think about great wines too. You just keep remembering them. They keep coming back to you. And so I think I would pair J.L. Richardson's book with a local favorite from Niagara, 30 Bench, Small Lot, Cabernet Franc. And it's made by rock star winemaker Emma Garner. It's bold and it's brooding, but most importantly, this wine has great structure. Important for books, too, as I understand. It's got a long finish that lasts forever, so I think it'd be a great pairing with Gutter Child. Oh my God, what a great line. So great structure and a finish that lasts forever. I feel like you're reviewing the book there. It's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, books and bottles, right? <laughs> so, so Natalie, are there dystopian wines? Like, What would you do with Margaret mm. Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale? Right. Well, it's actually funny you bring that one up because I I actually selected it as a book in high school for a book report, which really worried my English teacher because it's got such dark themes. So I absolutely loved it. But I guess in the spirit of a dystopia, I'm going to do an anti-pairing, Sam. I, I, I don't want anti. you to pair this. Yeah, anti-pairing. Do it. not pair. Do not pair this book with The Handmaid's uh, tale wines. Wait, wait, there's wait, actually, wait, wait. There's, a, there's yeah. something called the Handmaid's Tale wines. Is this like from yeah. the Handmaid's Tale world that somehow got mm -hmm. transposed across the multiverse to here? It did. So MGM, I think it was. I, I wrote about these wines a while back, but they did a partnership for the, I think it was for the TV series. But here's why I don't recommend them. You'd think it'd be a natural pairing. They named each wine after the characters in the book, like Offred. So Alfred's Pinot Noir was described as beguiling and seductive and uh, she needs of to... Of course. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I thought, you know, why are you naming these wines after sort of the possessive non-name, non-moniker of the woman's commander? Why not use their real names like June and Emily if you really want to get all empowerment about it? So instead, I would recommend pairing... Handmaid's Tale with Nasty Woman Wines. I love these. They're from Oregon and Washington. And each of the labels of these Nasty Woman Wines, which were founded on Election Day 2016. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. But anyway. We can't they, call it anti-Trump wines. So. No, no, no. They're, you know, anti-45. But each label features a real-life woman in sort of like a gritty black and white photo. They're staring confidently at the camera. There's no photoshopping, no mommy's juice and whatever. But one of the labels has the picture of Cheryl Strayed, you know, the best-selling memoirist yeah, of wild. wild. Yes, exactly. So I just love it because on the label, she's on the label for persistent Pinot Gris. Of course, <laughs> the winemaker had to get permission, but they tell the real stories of real women and the struggles they went through, and 20% of the profits go to women empowerment groups. So I love the whole backstory and back label of this wine, frankly. So I think that'd be a perfect pairing, whether you're reading Cheryl Strayed's Wild or The Handmaid's Tale, because persistence is everything in flavor. This one, this wine has a persistent lime zest. And I think most importantly, whether it's books or bottles, it has no bitter aftertaste. Oh, another great book description. I'm going to use that. I'm going to start. I'm going to call you and say, Natalie, I, how would you describe this book? Because then I'll just use it to pitch it to editors. Exactly. Just substitute the word book and bottle. You'll be fine. Awesome. So <laughs> not that this will happen that often in our lives, but let's say we're stuck on a boat with a tiger. <laughs> what would be a great wine with, let's say, Yann Martel's Life of Pi? 
Right. Well, let's see. That um, I would have to go with a dessert wine, right? I know it's PI versus PIE. But anyway, <laughs> um, I would go with Tinhorn Creek's Kerner ice wine. So it's got these luscious flavors of ripe apricot and peach and sort of honeydew notes that I think would be perfect with life of pie, pie, and maybe having your cake and eating it too. And maybe the tiger has a sweet tooth. So you just have to give the wine to the exactly. tiger, t- knocks the Ex- tiger out, then you can escape. Distract the tiger, <laughs> put the pie at the other end of the boat and you drink the wine at the other end. Yes. Perfect. Okay, let's move things along here. What about Emma Donahue's room? This is the story mm. of a young mother and her five-year-old son, Jack, who are both held captive in a small room for many years. It's told from Jack's perspective, which is fascinating, especially after they're freed from the room. Jack doesn't want mm. things to change because that's all he's ever really known. But eventually, when they both revisit the room, he's able to let it go, which is mm. kind of, I guess, a message about trauma. Anyway, the room hasn't changed, but he has. Yes. Yes, exactly. Wow. This was a wonderful book. Again, sorry to lasso it back, but this is my job here. (laughs) I think (laughs) wines change over time too. So there's the first time you try wine and it has a certain taste. But then if you go back to that wine, like a different bottle, but of the same wine, years later, the wine has changed, but so have you. And you know, when I open the same bottle years later, decades later, I can often remember exactly where I was, who I was with, what I was even eating. Our sense of smell is the only sense that ties directly to emotion and memory in the brain. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Because when Proust was eating that Madeline, it didn't bring back everything because of how it tasted. It brought back everything because of how it smelled. You know, as he ate it, you know, you get the smells. So- I love doing that, revisiting old wines, old books, just to see how I've changed over time. So given room is a very tightly confined setting, but eventually it's, you know, very expansive in its scope, universal. That's the ideal for books and bottles to start with the specific and go wide. I would probably go with a Bordeaux blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot from a very good vintage, though, like 2020. 2020, of course, wasn't a great vintage for humans, but it was spectacular <laughs> for wine. So somebody won. Um, yeah, and, exactly. and apparently it was a good year for books, if you look back on it. Yeah, well, there you go. See, there's a silver lining or whatever. A Bordeaux, like Shadow Clark, would not be ready for drinking right now. You want to have patience, put it in your cellar so that it knits together over time and then comes out more subtle, more complex, more enjoyable As I say, patience does have its rewards with books sometimes when you have to get through the tough slog, maybe at the first or through the middle. But in the end, if you can stay with it, often that's the reward, right? Thanks so much, Natalie. This has been so enlightening in so many ways, except now I feel like I'm not a day drinker, but I really feel like I need a glass of maybe something red. (laughs) Um, Then I've done my job. (laughs) You (laughs) really have. Okay, so where can we find you in these pairings? Sure. So you can find them all at my website, nataliemcclain.com. And I would love to hear from thirsty readers and listeners if they have a favorite book or bottle pairing, or if they've got a book that they want me to pair. I guess the last pairing I would make, Sam, is with the book that you and I are working on, my memoir. And I take solace from a number of the books that we've just talked about were rejected multiple times from various publishers. So I'm going to be tough And I'm going to be hopeful and optimistic this fall when we go out with the memoir on submission. And if not, you and I, Sam, we're just going to uh, have a glass or four together, right? I'm going to I'm going to say we're going to it's going to be a bottle of something bubbly. That's my prediction. uh, I'm hoping when we're we're done this whole enterprise. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, Uh, Cheers, Sam. Great, great chat. Thank you. That's our show, folks. Thanks for your time and attention and to all of our guests for coming on. Once again, we're grateful and very thankful uh, to our producer, Andrew Kaufman. And if you do like us and are enjoying Agent Provocateur, please subscribe for free at agentprovocateur.substack.com and come back next week when we talk about Harry and Megan's big book deal. And we have our panel on 
men in publishing and boys in books. Until then, take care. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Sam Hyatt. Now I'll share some tips on organizing an informal wine tasting with your friends or your book club. I spoke about this topic on one of my regular segments for CTV's The Social, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 154. So there are many excellent reasons to host a wine tasting party or even to form a wine club. For one thing, wine is a social beverage, one that's meant to be shared with friends. And it's more fun to drink than to buy Tupperware. Unless, of course, you're drinking from the Tupperware. Just don't do that. The only goal is to enjoy yourself and perhaps find a favorite new bottle. Although wine does lend itself to serious technical analysis, that's not really necessary. Just as you don't need a PhD to talk about a book in a book club, you don't need to be an expert on wine to talk about it and share your opinions about it. Most people just want to socialize over a good glass or three, though it's a bonus if we can learn something too. Wine can also kickstart the conversation. It's something that people can talk about, especially when they're meeting each other for the first time. Tasting with friends in your home or theirs is usually less intimidating than going to formal wine tasting events. For starters, you don't have to wear that tweed jacket or listen to discussions on how the 1956 September rains ruined the Riesling fruit set in the Rheingau. You also get to decide on the day, the time, the theme, the accompanying food, the people, and the cost of the wines. Wine tastings can be a great way to get to know your neighbors, perhaps by inviting them over for a barbecue and matching some big red wines. Tastings can also be a creative twist on holiday cocktail or dinner parties. They're usually less work than setting up all the ingredients for a cocktail bar or certainly cooking a full meal. But if you plan to throw a dinner party anyway, why not serve a flight of wines? Several at once rather than one glass at a time. Just remember to moderate what you pour with about two to three ounces of each wine instead of a full glass. That is, unless you're going to have everybody sleeping over at your house after dinner. With tens of thousands of wines on the store shelves, the choices can be overwhelming. You have to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince, that delicious, reasonably priced bottle. Group tastings can maximize your wine budget since you can sample up to six to eight wines for the cost of the one bottle that you bring to the group. Tastings can also help you select wines for weddings, parties, and holidays such as Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Hanukkah. You can even use a tasting to choose the bottles to help stock a newlywed couple's first cellar or to lay down for your baby's 21st birthday. The first step in hosting a tasting is to choose who you want to invite. I strongly suggest picking only people you like. Beyond that, perhaps gather those who share the same knowledge level of wine. If one person happens to be very knowledgeable, just make sure he or she isn't an insufferable bore who will dominate the conversation. If one person happens to be very knowledgeable, just make sure he, she, they isn't an insufferable bore who will dominate the conversation. Maybe they can even lead the tasting. Some groups occasionally invite a guest expert to begin the tasting, then follow the formal talk with the informal group chat. Ideally, invite 6 to 12 people. It's a good number to have a lively conversation and to sample between six and eight bottles. And again, you don't want everyone inebriated by the end of the night. Over the course of two or three hours, your guests will probably consume two to three five-ounce glasses of wine, about half a standard bottle, 750 ml or 26 ounce. Tasting samples of two to three ounces each are just enough to get a good sense of the wine. This increases the number of wines you can try. Between 6 and 12 people can share a single bottle. The wines you choose will depend on whether you prefer a vertical or a horizontal tasting. This doesn't actually refer to your position while you drink as the night wears on. Rather, it means comparing wines by variables such as grape, region, or year. For example, if you compare a selection of Australian Shirazes from different wineries, that's a horizontal tasting. But comparing Shirazes of one Australian winery for each year, say, 
from 2010 to 2020 is a vertical tasting. Similarly, trying Shiraz from Chile, California, and Australia made in the same year, that's a horizontal tasting. As is sampling Shiraz with other red wines such as Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Zinfandel. You can even get more particular by comparing Shirazes from the same region, some of which are oaked and others are not. This side-by-side comparison allows you to taste how certain variables affect the wine and which you like best. But these are advanced tasting techniques. At the beginning, your best bet is to keep it simple and low-key, so no one's intimidated. Other ideas for themes include asking everyone to bring a memorable bottle and share its story. Perhaps they drank it to christen their first apartment, or it's from a wonderful trip to Italy. Another is to choose wines that break stereotypes, such as the myth that the only good Canadian wine is ice wine. Try Canadian Pinot Noir and Riesling. They'll knock your socks off. Or just have fun with a retro 1970s tasting and see if those groovy tipples, such as Matus, Blue Nun, Piador, and Black Tower, have changed since then. More likely, your own taste has. At least I hope you got rid of those wide lapels and lava lamps. You can send invitations on psychedelic purple paper, get out the love beats and wide leg pants. I think they're even coming back in style now. Play those old favorites such as The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Have a fondue. Food matching is a great way to theme a tasting, deciding which wines will go best with, say, seafood, cheese, desserts, hors d'oeuvres, and so on. The food doesn't have to be elaborate. Nibbles are fine. Opt for dishes that aren't too spicy or hot, since these can numb the palate. Unless, of course, you're trying to find the ultimate wine for a fiery curry. Another option is the blind tasting. This does not involve handcuffs and blindfolds. But rather, you brown bag or cover all the wines and taste them without knowing their identities or seeing the labels. And then at the end, everyone can vote on their favorite. Guests can rank them in order of preference with a score of 1 to 10, or even play Roman Emperor giving a Venus thumbs up or down. In the end, they'll all go down without a struggle, I can assure you. And then you can reveal the identities of the wines. That's always fun. As the host, you might want to throw in a Chilean Cabernet among those from California, for example, to see if guests can identify the ringer. Moving on to practical matters such as cost, your group can determine how much to spend on wines. In fact, sticking within the same price range for all the wines is a far better way to compare them than pitting a $10 wine against one that costs $50. Once you've agreed on a budget, you can decide whether the host buys all the wines and is reimbursed or whether each person or couple brings a bottle to the tasting. Another consideration is stemware. Six to 12 people sampling six to eight wines apiece means a lot of glasses. You can cut down somewhat by trying two flights or two sets of four wines at a time, and then simply rinsing or reusing the glasses for the second flight of four wines. But if you want to try all the wines at once, aren't you keen? There are several options. Guests can bring their own glasses from home. You can rent glasses for the occasion from a party rental shop or the group can pool funds to buy glassware for the tastings. Choose tulip-shaped glasses that concentrate the aromas of both red and white wines and allow you to taste them more easily. Those itsy-bitsy golf ball-sized glasses that you often see in restaurants are useless, and the fancy large glasses the size of fish bowls are clumsy and take up too much space on the table. All that glassware may not fit on your coffee table, so you may prefer to taste the wines at your dining room table. Then afterwards, you can retire to the living room for tea, coffee, dessert, and more sparkling conversation. One of the less sociable aspects of wine tasting is expectorating, spitting out your samples. No one should have to swallow wine they don't like or be forced to drink too much. And even if you don't have a white carpet, you'll want to give your guests something in which to spit. For this charming tradition, you'll want some version of a spittoon on the table, whether it's a central ice bucket or individual glasses or mugs. Opaque rather than clear preserves a much-needed illusion of delicacy. And just forget what Miles, the character in Sideways, did with the spit bucket in that tasting room. Ugh. 
Some guests may think this habit is as appalling as spitting out their food, but you can help remove the social stigma by explaining that it's perfectly acceptable and that you can taste many more wines if you spit rather than swallow. Though in a social setting, a force stronger than gravity makes most of us want to swallow whatever's in our glass. It's also important to make sure everyone has a glass of water. Not only is alcohol dehydrating, but guests won't drink as much wine if they have water to slake their thirst. Now, on to the fun part. Tasting the wine. There are four basic things to look for when you taste wine. The look, smell, taste, weight, and finish. The first means that you need a good light, though of course that's a balance between creating a cozy social setting and being able to see what you're doing. Candlelight isn't ideal for judging the color of wine, but you also don't want to create a harshly lit, lab-like environment. Look at the wine tipped on its side against a white tablecloth or even a piece of paper to tell how clear it is and whether there's anything floating in it. There should be no floating bits. The floating pieces of cork does not mean your wine is corked. That's something else entirely. That's a fault. And the wine will smell like an old musty attic or wet cardboard. You'll also be able to see how old the wine is. Young whites are usually green at the edges and become a deeper yellow or gold with time. Reds are usually purple or ruby in youth and turn to garnet or brick with age. Avoid holding your glass up to the light, though. This tells you little other than how many colors the wine can reflect from your wallpaper. Next, give the glass a swirl and inhale deeply. Don't be shy about this inelegant task. Get your nose well inside the glass. Since wine's aromas are volatile, airborne, smell is considered the determining factor of wine character. In fact, we can detect millions of aromas with our noses, but only five tastes in our mouths. Sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and a savory character called umami or umami. Try sipping the wine with your nose plugged and you'll see the difference. What do the wine's aromas remind you of? Wood chips, cherries, apples, your Aunt Mildred's spice cake? This is a subjective judgment that becomes sharper with time and experience. This is why it's also a good reason to get rid of competing odors. Ask guests not to wear strong perfume or cologne. Now taste the wine. Swirl it around your mouth and aerate it by sucking in a little air into your mouth, kind of like a backwards whistle, to further enhance the taste. You may want to practice this in the shower at home first. At least don't wear white the first time you try it. Think about not only what flavors you detect, but also how the wine feels in your mouth. Heavy as cream, light as skim milk, or somewhere in between like whole milk. Finally, swallow the wine to see how long the flavor impression lasts. This is called its finish. A long finish means that you can still sense the wine, smell it in your mouth for eight seconds or more after swallowing. A medium finish is about four to seven seconds and fewer than four seconds, is short. Like most sensual pleasures in life, the longer, the better. Wine tastings are one of the simplest yet most enjoyable ways to entertain, and they can be as educational or as hedonistic as you like. They can accommodate just about any budget theme, occasion, or taste. All that's necessary are a few good friends and a few good bottles. Cheers! All right, so in the show notes, you will find links to Sam's podcast and literary agency, the full transcript of our conversation, as well as all my tips on organizing a wine tasting, links to where you can buy my books, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcleancom forward slash 154. You won't want to miss next week when I talk about the Beaujolais craze that happens on the third Thursday of November every year. What's all the fuss about? Should you stay up until midnight to taste the new release? Find out next week. In the meantime, if you missed episode 22, go back and take a listen. I take a behind-the-scenes look at writing my first book, Red, White, and Drunk All Over. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Wine has given me an excuse to be extremely nosy 
and to ask impertinent questions that I would never ask. I'm an introvert, which is great for writing, but I also need a crutch. And wine is my crutch, not just personally, (laughs) but professionally. It allows me to go into people's homes, to sit at their family dining tables, and to ask really blunt and sometimes embarrassing questions. And so wine has taken me into places that I would never have access to, nor would my readers. And when I was on a book tour for my last book, they said, how on earth did you get into Domaine Romani Conti? It comes out on sale at about a couple thousand dollars a bottle. It's not me who's getting access. It's the fact that I bring you, my readers, with me. They want to reach you. They can't accommodate all of you. So they let me in. And that's how I get to ask those juicy questions. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and books and wine tasting club tips we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a wine with a towering structure and a long, everlasting finish to match the book you're reading. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers.